You may be seated. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul sets out to define what love is. And uh, most of us know that, that verse. I mean, the second you hear it, you know, if I set out to to pro prophesy and, and speak all these great things, but I have not loved, you know. It's one of Paul's most poetic uh, moments, I think, in all of his writings. There are times where Paul kind of goes on and on and on, kind of like me some Sundays, you know, and and uh, you're just like, okay, Paul, we got that like 15 re repetitions ago. Um, move on. But here, Paul is about as poetic as he could possibly be in describing what love is. So he sets out to define what love is. Now he's writing to the church in Corinth who are engaged in an argument over whose spiritual gifts are the best. I mean, what better things do we have to argue about besides who's better than the other? Where are my girls? They know. <laughs> right? The competition, right? Well, I speak in tongues. Because this is what the Corinth church really liked. They thought, like, wow, if you could speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit was truly with you. I mean, that, that's great that you cook really well and people like your food. But I speak in tongues. I mean, anyone can cook, but I speak in tongues, you know? And Paul's just, you know, he had, he had established this church. And he had taught them the basics. That we are all in the same boat. That none of us are better than the other. That you may have this gift at which I'm not gifted, but I have this gift. And somehow, in the mix of all of that, we complement each other. And this is what the body of Christ is supposed to be like. And yet, Paul leaves, moves on, establishes other churches, is doing other things. And what does he get? A letter saying, Paul, now you know I speak in tongues, and I've got to be better than that guy. And Paul's just like, have I been away from you that long that you, you forget what the message of the gospel is? This argument may sound chi childish. Um, as my children argue, I think, my goodness, when will they grow up? And then I see them growing up and I say, stop. <laughs> but it may seem childish. But power plays tend to be childish. And many adults find themselves in power plays. Who is the most prominent person in the community? Who uh, ha makes the most money and lives in the greatest house? Who is the greatest in the church? I mean, the churches are no, uh, nowhere exempt from, from power plays at all. Wherever people are, and wherever people are organized, we, we tend to find this. And of course, the idea is that if I can claim to have the greatest of the spiritual gifts, I mean, after all, which one of us here speaks tongues? If I, if I can claim to have one of the greatest spiritual gifts, well then, everyone else should listen to me, right? In his definition, Paul, you know, oftentimes, we, we, if we think of it, of, of love as an emotion, right? It's something that makes you feel good. You think of like walking next to your significant other down the beach, you know, your heart is beating, right? Like, I'm in love, you know, and it feels good. It's all about feeling and emotion. But Paul does not define love as an emotion anywhere. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's kind of funny that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the most commonly read scripture at weddings. Because that's not the love Paul's talking about. Or if it were, boy, that love would endure a lot more than it actually does. Now, Paul's not defining love as an emotion, but he's defining it as a series of actions. Love is the act of patience. Love is the act of kindness. Love rejoices in the truth. Love 
never ends. We live in a culture where we love when things go our way. But when they don't, there's no more love there. But that's not love. Because love, according to Paul, never ends. He also defines love in terms of what it is not. Love is not arrogant or rude or boastful. Love is not stubborn or irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. So Paul uses actions to describe love. But we often do confuse love with emotions. After all, love is... I, I once heard somebody preach that love has nothing to do with emotions. Love is not emotional at all. Well, that's not true. Because love is tied into our emotions, and when we're in love, we do feel it. And when we love something, we do feel it. My daughters sometimes do things that really anger me. Really, really anger me. But I love them. I love them. And regardless of how angry I am with them, regardless of how much they're irking me in the moment, my love never stops for them. In fact, I ache more when they do things that I know they shouldn't do because I love them. And never in, in my mind do I think, you know what, I'm done with them. I'm done with them. Because that love never ends. And I've seen parents who see their kids sitting in jail have done the worst of things. And part of them is disgusted with what they've done. In fact, probably all of them are disgusted with what they've done, what their kids have done. But yet, they still visit them in prison. I can't imagine what that kind of experience must be like. And I hope I never have to. <laughs> <laughs> but the love never ends. In the Tina, Tina Turner song, uh, What's Love Got to Do With It, which is why I named this, the sermon what it is, she, she says, what's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? This is what our culture tells us love is. It's a second-hand emotion. I don't need that emotion, right? What's love got to do with it? But love is not an emotion, is it? I mean, yes, our, our emotions are tied into love, and we, we certainly react emotionally as a result of love sometimes, they are not the same thing as love. And I think when you look at divorce rate in this country, or some of the other issues in this country, we can see that emotions are not the same thing as love. I mean, everyone feels good on their wedding day, right? Everyone feels good when they're first skipping down the road, and they call it the honeymoon period for a reason, right? It's like everything's going great until you realize that the person you're living with wasn't the same person you thought you married. Then all of a sudden, the love ends, you know? <laughs> so oftentimes we make decisions based on emotion. I know sometimes I can be, you know, it's funny because my wife and I are totally the opposite of the stereotypes of men and women. My wife is very frugal, very frugal. And me, I could go and spend all day at the mall and buy everything. That's why I marry her. She keeps me, she keeps me alive. But we often act on emotion. When we go to a car lot, how many of us are often buying a car because we absolutely need it? And how many are buying a car we absolutely need as opposed to a car we really want? I mean, if we were to buy a car we absolutely need, it would probably like be a Geo Net Metro, you know, like that, that goes to like 20 miles an hour up a hill because it has no power. But it's economical. It gets us from point A to point B. But we want the four-wheel drive, big, you know, like, or the sports car. 
We love our sports cars. We often act on emotion. But it doesn't always lead us to a place of health, a place where we need to be. Now, I'm not saying buying big cars is a bad thing. But what I'm trying to show is we can't mix the two together. We can't say, well, it feels good, so it must be love. Not if we're going to go by Paul's definition. Oftentimes, we'll confuse love with raising money for charity or taking care of your neighbor, helping the poor, caring for the sick. And love does inspire those things. But Paul quickly states otherwise. It isn't those actions that are love. It's love that produces those actions. If all we do is care for the sick and help the poor and, and, um, and do charity, we're no different than the man, well, the man house is related to a church. We're no different than, let's say, uh, social services or Habitat for Humanity. Now, I'm not saying the people that do those things don't love. Because love very well may be what's driving them to do what they do. But if all we're doing are charities, perfect example is anytime there's a disaster, we often will see like concerts on TV. I know my, my favorite band, Bon Jovi, always play at these benefit concerts. Bruce Springsteen, they all get together and they're having a good time and they're raising money, which is a good thing. And I would never discourage that, especially in a time of crisis. Yet, that being said, would we necessarily say that love is what's driving them? It may be. It may not be. Without love, we're no different than a charitable organization. Love is not speaking in tongues or having prophetic powers or possessing wisdom or having faith or doing charity or any of these things. Those things are a result of love. But we don't necessarily have to do charity because we love. We could just be doing charity because it makes us feel good. Now, it doesn't mean that if you love, you're going to give away all of your possessions or endure trials and tribulations, roll yourself across the floor like a, a, a mat for people to stomp on. But the point is, is that if you love, you will find yourself in places you would have never, ever imagined yourself to be. Like going without food for 24 hours, when you love food, right Miranda? Going for, without food for 24 hours and shoveling. I don't know how many, have you ever heard the, the phrase working up an appetite? Now imagine doing it on an empty stomach, right? When you're working, all of a sudden you become mindful of, of the rest of your body. And you do work up an appetite that you already had before you started working. So it's amazing where love will take you. <clears throat> but for Paul, love goes beyond just being an action. Love is more than just an action. There's a song by DC Talk called uh, Love is a Verb. And that's true to a set, in a sense. Love is a verb <clears throat> because when you love, it causes you to do actions. It causes it. Everything else flows from love. But love is more than an action. It's not just a verb. If there are two words that actually sum up Paul's definition of love, it would be selfless presence. Isn't that a fitting description of love? Let's take the example of a parent who really is disgusted with their kids and their kid, let's say, murdered a few people and is sitting in jail, maybe even sitting on death row, and yet the mother is still there. Selfless presence. Does she want to be there? Probably not. I know my mom always said, if you ever go to prison, son, I'll never visit you. Now, I can wager that if I had gone to prison, she probably would have visited me, whether she wanted to or not, because it's selfless presence. That's what love is. It is not through selfless presence 
I mean, is it not through selfless presence that we learn of what true love is? Like the selfless presence of a parent? Now, I experienced my parents' love many times. I, I can tell you all sorts of wild stories of my youth. Some which would be entertaining, some which would be probably disgusting, some which, you know, I've done a lot of things that my mom was not proud about when I was a teenager. Made lots of mistakes. But my mom never stopped loving me. And that meant that when I was doing things I shouldn't be doing, she was right behind me to let me know. Even when I let my friend drive my car, and my mom happened to see or had the hunch. I don't even know if she saw it. She, you know, the, the eyes behind your head thing, you know? Like, she just had the hunch that I was doing something I shouldn't be doing. And she went out and found where I was and let me know she was not pleased. Right in front of all my friends. Didn't feel like love to me on that day, but it was. The selfless presence of a spouse or some, or, or some other like loved one. I've experienced this in my life as well. I would not be standing here today if it were not for Bernadette. Bernie has been instrumental in my life as an adult since I've known her. It's because of her uh, that we, we have the life that we have right now. It's because of her that I got through seminary. It's because of her that I'm even following this call of being a pastor. Because I had given up hope on finding a job and cracked a wisecrack about, oh, maybe I should become a pastor. There's job security, right? What was I thinking, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> um, and two weeks later, she printed out all the things I would need to do if I were to go down that path. Out of the blue. <laughs> Ultimately, love is not just a verb, but love is also a noun. Love is a person. Love is God in the person of Jesus. Love is the voice resounding throughout you. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Love is the eternal presence of God, as Jesus embodied and witnessed before us. The same Jesus that would walk around and teach his people, that would try to right the wrongs that he saw happening around him, that would weep over a city gone astray, the very city that would order his execution the very presence that said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Was he happy he was being nailed to the cross? Was he, was he liking what they were doing to him? Did it feel good? No. But he loved them all the same. Love is a noun. Love is the voice that tells you, I am calling you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. The same voice that Jeremiah heard. The same voice that Jeremiah heard that persists on calling you despite your fears, insisting that you do not be afraid. For I am with you to deliver you. Love is the driving force behind all that we do. If we sit in church but have not love, we are nothing. If we help people but do not have love, we are no more than a charity organization. Without love, we are nothing. Without love, we are without true life. So what's love got to do with it? 
Everything. That's what love has to do with it. Everything. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you and praise you for this family we have here. I thank you and praise you for each person in this place whom you have called here to not only be loved, but to be love. Just as Jesus was love and remains love for us, so too are we to be love and remain loved in the lives of all around us, even the ones who will not love us back, even the ones who hate us. This is what you've called us to do. And there are so many different ways we can do it. Guide us to be your love in this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.